Kuzman was a very tough left-hander who kept the ball low, kept the ball at the knees with pinpoint control and a lot of movement on the ball. Great pitcher. Throw hard? That man could throw. When we were off to Martin and Liddy's farm, Jerry had pitched horrible. I wasn't even capable of catching him. He, he could throw a curveball that would hit me in the face, you know. He could throw the ball right through a barn board. Side of the barn, baseball would go right through that. He was a physically strong fella, and we used to talk a lot about working on a farm and what he did as a kid and, and, and how he experienced so much in the outdoors. I grew up by Appleton, but I went to school in Morris, at the Morris Agricultural School. All the farm kids went to school there because it was only six months. Orville, my oldest brother, and Jerry went to school there too. In grade school, we played softball. He played baseball out in the country there. They had a team. He had a very good major league fastball that moved. It's one thing to throw a ball 95 miles an hour straight as a string, and any good hitter in the big leagues is going to hit that fastball. Jerry threw 95 miles an hour, and the ball rotated, moved, danced, in, out, up, down. The 69 Mets were a group of unheralded players who were not stars on their own, but congealed together with each contributing enough to turn them into winners. I think the, the uh, Las Vegas odds against the Mets at the start of the season would have been hundreds to one. Um, by the time they got to the World Series, it wouldn't have been 100 to one, but it would have been probably four or five to one, which is huge. Mets had never finished higher than ninth. Um, they had been in existence for seven years, and they had finished last five of the seven years. So they had been also rans and, and really doormats of the National League for their whole existence. So there was no real reason to expect them to do anything special in 1969. We, uh, at age 16 and 17, kind of, you know, bummed around a bit together and uh, did some fun things. And then uh, we actually played baseball together, so we knew each other. Then his career took off, right, uh, in the Army. They, they noticed him, found him in the Army. My dad says, well, why don't you go in the Army and get that over with, because everybody had to go in the Army in those days. So while I was debating, I got drafted in the Army, because I didn't enroll in school quick enough. So I put two years in the service, and uh, I signed up for engineering, but they put me in missiles. So... <laughs> And then uh, I got transferred to El Paso, Texas, and I played baseball for two seasons down there. And one of his buddies he met when he got to Texas, his dad was an usher at Shea Stadium. So this buddy of Jerry's called his dad and says, you better have a scout. Look at this guy. This guy's good, really good. He didn't sign and didn't sign and didn't sign because he wanted more money, and every time... They would come to see him, they'd cut the price by 500 bucks or 300 bucks or whatever. And he said he just finally had to sign because otherwise he would have paid them to play. For the first four years of their existence, the Mets were managed by Casey Stengel. The team was terrible. They found entertaining ways of losing. Casey Stengel was sort of clownish, and he would distract the press and the fans by... Uh, his buffoonery. It was not an atmosphere that had even a premise of being about winning. They were there to entertain the fans. They were built to uh, be popular and to supplant the Yankees as the most popular team in town. And sure enough, by the time Casey Stengel left in 1965, the Mets were drawing more fans. They brought National League Baseball back to New York, and it really was a, a Dodger and a Giant town, even more than the Yankees, because by that time, the Yankees were winning so much, they became routine. I wanted to play with the Twins, but um, the Twins in 65, 64, they had a really good ball club. In 65, they went to the World Series against the Dodgers. But the Mets in 64 were finishing like 48 games out, so... 
I figured uh, they needed pitching much more than the Twins did, and if I was good enough to make the big leagues, I'd make it quicker with the Mets. I signed then with the Mets um, August 28th of 64. Uh, they had picked up two good starting pitchers, uh, Tom Seaver and Jerry Kuzman, but their offense wasn't formidable, and they had no experience uh, as, a, as a winning team. And that, that continued until Gil Hodges showed up. And Gil Hodges, who had played for the Brooklyn Dodgers when they were the best team in the National League and won the pennant, Hodges was a, was a hard-nosed, pretty serious guy who believed that if you weren't trying to win, you didn't belong there. New manager Gil Hodges holds a strategy meeting with veteran pitchers Don Cardwell and Cal Kuntz, youngsters Jerry Kuzman and Tom Seaver, and catcher Jerry Grody. But I think the big thing, uh, Coos, for you is to get ahead of him first and then worry about pitching to spots. I'm altogether different from Coosie, but I would save him, give him his best stuff. Just give him his hard fastball and stay over the top and once in a while drop down on him some. My first two games were shutouts in the big leagues against the Giants and the Dodgers. Opening day, bases loaded and nobody out, and here's Willie Mays. What a jam to be in. I have to try and strike him out. When it was over, the Mets had won three to nothing. Jerry Kuzman had held the San Francisco Sluggers to seven singles in seven different innings. My ERA was like in the 1.9 something that whole year till second to last game of the season. I gave up six runs in Atlanta, so my ERA went up to 2.12. Forty years ago, the starting pitcher was expected to do the heavy lifting and to pitch as far as he possibly could the whole game. His endurance was incredible, just incredible. It was a nine inning, like in the World Series in 69, you know the story. First game, he went eight and two thirds of an inning. The second game, he goes nine innings and, and wins uh, the game. Yeah. You know, going the distance, nine innings, not like it is today. It's a pitch count of 100, 110, give me a break. These guys were 150, 200 pitch counters. It's changed a lot. I think that to pay a man 12, 13 million dollars to pitch 40 innings a year, uh, a closer. Wait a minute. Uh, these starters, uh, they should gear it up more and pitch more into the game. Go the eight, nine innings themselves. Well, you know, it's a game. It's a game of money and. To Jerry, it was a game of fun, and it's still all of his whole life it was fun. It was never about the money. Tom Seaver uh, came along and had a lot of attention from the first day he joined the Mets. He had been drafted by the Atlanta Braves, and it was a violation of his contract. The commissioner ruled the signing was illegal. Teams had to take a chance on bidding for him. Plus, he had been a star in college. He had been a star at the USC, and everybody was after him as a good pitcher. Well, he comes to the Mets, and he goes to Jacksonville, and he's a star in the minor leagues. And then he comes in his rookie year, and he wins the Rookie of the Year honors. So he was a very, very significant pitcher on that team. Kuzman, on the other hand, had to prove his ability. He didn't have a minor league reputation. He didn't have a college uh, starring career. He had come out of the Army. He had gone into the minor leagues. He had some trouble in the minor leagues. He didn't have a uh, high salary. It's nothing to do. He borrowed money from the general manager, um, Joe McDonald. And finally, he comes to the team, and he came without a lot of fanfare. Tom and I pitched together uh, for over 10 years there, and it was the righty-lefty act, the Tom and Jerry act. There's Different writers build us different ways. He was a very strong pitcher and a great leader on our pitching staff, and we had a lot of fun competing against each other. Not that we pitched against each other, but we would, oh, we had little bets on the side where if he struck out 10, I'd try to strike out 11, or if he, I struck out 12, he'd strike out 13. Kuzman actually had a better year than Seaver did in 1968. Seaver won 16 games, and Kuzman won 19 games. And Seaver had been Rookie of the Year, and Kuzman lost out on Rookie of the Year by one vote to Johnny Bench. 
but the two of them were a great one-two punch. Seaver right-handed, Kuzman left-handed, that kind of balance helps a team. Seaver really knew how to play the press, play the media, and he wanted to be a star. Yes, it's not only do they want to succeed, which I think every major leaguer wants to succeed, but he also liked the notoriety. He liked the attention. He had a glamorous wife who loved the attention. They were sort of identified, Seaver and Nancy Seaver, as America's golden couple. Poozman, on the other hand, just sort of did his job. He didn't sort of hang around with the writers and go out of his way to get media attention. When you asked him a question, he answered it. He was always friendly. He was always honest. But there wasn't the idea of creating the character of Jerry Kuzman. Siva created the character of Tom Siva. And even though they liked each other, there always was an undertone of a rivalry. I always felt, uh, covering the team all those years, that most of the players really related to Jerry much more as a pal than they did to Siva.